My apologies. We might as well keep this for posterity. Yeah. So you'd, we arrived at the hotel after. We arrived at the hotel and we went into our various rooms. I had, you know, I didn't know what room I was going to be in, but we went. I went in just to drop my bag off and then meet again. And then immediately the door. I mean, you know, who knows whether this was anything to do with anything other than the, perhaps the, like Becky says, the hotel itself is crumbling. But the door locked in its, and I couldn't un, undo the lock mechanism. It was sort of. For some reason, it was just uh, it wouldn't open. It was literally locked. I think I think it was just turning in the uh, in the, the handle was just turning. It just completely had broken inside, as the like the Yale had gone or something. I think did I did I text you? I think I text you. I said I rang you. Said I'm locked you in my room. Becky, because I was in the shower at the time, and Becky, I said I'm in the shower. Tell Reese I'll be down to two one three, which is the room we were in in the moment. And she said he wants to speak to you now. He says that the door's broken and he can't get out. And I said. Tell him to open it with the handle. Just pull on the handle. And <laughs> I think Reese knows how to open the door. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I I thought you might do, but I, I tried pretty... the, the normal, yeah, the normal routes to begin with, and then discovered it wouldn't work. Well, I so assume... that was just a very strange, no. immediate thing that happened. Was slightly unnerving because it was like, what's this about? Is it some sort of portent? Is it an omen? Is it just to start as the as we mean to go on? And then the rest of the night was, it was. I mean, I. Um, it's susceptible to um, being told about a place before and I didn't know much about it but there was certainly later on into the night when we were sat in various rooms in the dark it was certainly began to feel like I felt there was a certain sort of heavy presence in the room we were in and you were calling out on the bed weren't you CJ I, I remember well that. I actually what happened first was I came down to try and get you out of the room if you remember and we couldn't get you out. And I went down and asked the porter for another key and that didn't work either. And it turned out the pin had fallen inside the door. So in the end, the porter, you you threw your keys out of the window to me outside in the street while I stood put down below. <laughs> I don't remember this at all. Yeah, you, you <laughs> I do remember doing that. I do remember doing that, yes, yeah, yeah. Locked yeah, in there was a there was a there was a street light because I just remember gazing up and quoting Shakespeare, quoting Romeo and Juliet as you held the keys at my head. Which <laughs> I felt unnecessary venom, but um, yeah, I took the keys in. We tried to get out. And can you remember how you actually got out of the room in the end? No, I can't. I mean, I th was it someone that came from downstairs to uh, and they yeah. got they do it they with a the driver or something. Yeah, I didn't. Somebody take the door off. The they hinges. put the door off the hinges. If you look at the, the photos, door the, the door is like on its side by one end of the room, and you walked out into the corridor. And because you didn't have a door, you moved rooms. We moved you That's into right. another room. <laughs> and then yeah, I don't know so whether there was was there any. Um, then did we find out about that room that I was going to stay in? Yeah, yeah, we we found out then. Well, we I I think at that point Becky told you it was supposedly haunted. And because you had found there was quite a strange atmosphere while you were in there and you were locked in before we managed to get the door taken off the hinges. Um, luckily, the hinges were on the outside, as with all hotel doors, so they were able to remove the door. <laughs> but it does tell you something about the nature of the hotel. It's also interesting about memory that you'd forgotten that. And then I was yeah, laying yeah. on the bed. Becky was sitting on the end of the bed and Rob Tight was on the other bed because there were twin beds in the room. And you were sitting in a chair over in the bay window. Do you remember that over in the corner? Yes, I do remember that. Yeah. And then there was a kind of you said, "Did you go Rah! or something like that?" Or, Rah! I think it was. Yeah, there was some. That's right. Yeah, I thought you did it, just being slightly devilish. <laughs> no, no, no. I was. And you that. hadn't. There was no noise. No. Did no one else heard it? It was like a dog or something. Yeah, and it, and didn't I, I think I saw something like loom across the beds as well. That was yeah. another thing, in the dark. Well, Becky went up to the room to go and get some drinks, and you said something moved across the room towards you, and you suddenly stood up and left rather sharpishly. And apparently, when you walked into the other room, the, the other haunted room where we were staying, you fell over a bottle, bottle of Coca-Cola on the floor, which caused <laughs> Becky to scream, because we heard the screams from up the corridor, which didn't do anything for our nerves. That's and, right. Uh, Forgotten about that, yeah, I did. I liked the idea of BBC staff found dead in Coke horror. You know? <laughs> As Coca Cola finishes off somebody, but no, the bottle was left busy on the floor. You two didn't come back down for some reason, but then Rob, who was laying on the other bed, turned to me and said, "Chris, do you feel anything unusual?" And Rob's a complete cynic; he's an ass. And I turned around to him and just looked at him and said, 
Well, actually, it's really funny, but the shadow from the tree outside with the street lamp makes it look like there's a large black skeletal hand, like a huge claw, That's reaching right, out right. of the wall towards the top of your head, Rob. And I was only telling him it was a shadow, but at that point, he didn't say anything. He just got up and ran, and then I heard a shriek in the corridor, and the next thing I knew, he joined you two in the other room. And I stayed in there for another two or three minutes before my nerves gave up, and I... I don't know. We didn't go back into there for about an hour after that, did we? Yeah. By which time, everything seemed quite normal. It was just a, a slightly run-down, dilapidated hotel room. But yeah. it was it was an acutely weird experience because so many little things happened. The light blew. The light, the fan in the bathroom caused us all to jump. Um, you see, I, because I'm used to these things, and also because I made notes at the time, I remember quite a bit of it. But it's interesting yeah. how much you've forgotten now. I have, yeah. I, the biggest, I mean, I, I just sort of wrapped the whole thing up into that night when I got locked in the room. And that was very quick. That was at the very beginning of the night. Yeah. And then, yes, I, I sort of have not remembered in detail the uh, the later part of the night when we're in, sat in the room in the dark. But I did, now you've said about when you recalled the thing of the um, skeletal hand. That's, yeah, I remember that. And there was... So that um, tallied with what I'd seen in the dark. Yeah, you said you saw something in the room in the dark. Yeah, and of course, yeah. Becky had done her MSc on the haunting, so we knew the story, me and Becky did, but you didn't because you come straight from, we'd left the conference at the university that night because it was a one day conference and finished. And we went and we had pizza across the road and then we came back with another couple and they went off and it was just us and Rob Tight who made our way up to the hotel, as I recall. Yeah, that's right, yeah. No, I didn't know anything about it. It was kept deliberately sort of, uh, innocent of it all until we actually had the night. Well, thank you very much. Ooh. Becky, do you want to ask Reese any questions? Or? No, I don't think so. That was I good. I can't even remember more than Reese did. How much, what can you remember then? Or should we get back to you? No, that's right, it's no hurry. What were your experiences that night? Pretty much the same as what you've already said. Well, I don't think I actually personally had any experiences myself. Um, it was just party to, um, what's his name, Rob. <laughs> And his ghostly hand and Reese being locked in the room. So I don't really, I don't think anything else happened that I can remember. There was a light bulb. I mean, basically, things were falling apart around us, but this is the station hotel as it was. Yeah, it's kind of was it just the hotel just decaying, or was there anything actually uh, happening? While we're chatting to Reese, though, you still there, Reese? Yeah. If you're all right talking about it, there was one other weird experience we had together. There was the night that you came up to see us. Um, we were going to go to the uh, theatre down the road, but that fell through. So I phoned up Woodchester and we went down to Woodchester Mansion. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And I'd been quite ill that night, but um, Hayley, the renowned sceptic, came along. Uh, there was Hayley, Rob and Becky, I think, in the car, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And Becky almost killed me several times on the way there because I kept getting us lost in the dark. Do you remember? It uh, felt like a long drive, yeah. In the yeah, dark. I, it, not because of Becky's. No, I, th I think it was because my navigation wasn't very good and she was close to slaughtering me. But anyway, enough of that. Um, can you remember what happened when we got there? Um, I, I remember hearing whispers and footsteps above us. I think it was like there was, we were very sure there was no one on the level above us. And that was, I think, the, the takeaway from that night, that we were definitely... Uh, alone and I think I think I'm sure we all heard it or, or a few of us did but it, there was it was a, it was a walking across the top where and we went up there and there was no one I mean we knew there was no one there to confirm it there was no one there but that was a I think that was the one thing that was very odd about that because it found it sounded very much like somebody else also walking above just where we were I think at the time I got the impression that you all thought it was me initially but I was outside locked in the car because I'd been ill and I was very cold. And yeah. And Hayley heard it as well. She heard it as plainly as you did. She wrote about it on her blog afterwards. And I was quite surprised because the chaps who were there who run the ghost nights there, Chris Howell and um, Howley and co, they seemed as surprised as we did, didn't they? Or as you did. Yeah. And was yeah. it there or was it in the hotel where there was, you heard noises in the toilet? That was that was Haley who heard the noise in the toilets in the ladies' yeah. zone. 
when she went in, she heard someone call. She thought it was calling her name, and she Winchester. heard. Oh, and at the time, because I knew exactly who was in the building and who was where, you know, I could thoroughly say that there was nobody in the. But I mean, it's bizarre. You've gone to a ruined Gothic mansion in a secluded valley outside of uh, Stroud. It's very dark and wooded valley. You know, it's absolutely prime horror movie material. And where does Haley encounter the ghost? In the breeze block toilet block built about five years ago <laughs> yeah the one place that shouldn't be haunted and no strange because yeah the whole place is weird because it's not finished is it and yet it looks brand new it looks like they ran out of money during building a gothic which is exactly what happened um building yep. and it's so fresh looking it's like they're going to come back tomorrow and complete it it isn't like a ruin ruin in the same way that like Whitby Abbey is it's it's so new looking and it's just it's stopped it's like the Mary Celeste it's very strange I uh, what many many years ago we were filming there for a show called Most Haunted and we had I forgot what it's called Daniela Westbrook was holding a seance in the kitchens and uh, the the sound of our coffee machine because we asked from the green room I asked if we could have some coffee brought for us was mistaken for the ghost of a murdered French architect <laughs> anyway, that's uh, some distance from where we were started off. So thanks yeah, very much, Bree. Yeah. But Welcome. you have to, have to go ghost hunting again sometime when you've got some free time. Yes, of course. While you're on, what's coming up? What you what what are you doing this year? Anything you can, you're willing to share um, with Well, us? I start filming in two weeks, series eight of Inside Number Nine. I literally I'm going on Monday to Manchester to film the rest of to do another series, yeah. And you were worried written. after five. You were worried mm-hmm. after five they might not renew. I mean, oh well, yeah. I know it's now really years ago, thing. we would carry on yeah it's crazy but uh, yeah exciting it's good I think we've got some good new stories don't you think that you finally reached that level of recognition that you should have had from the beginning I mean it took a long time I think for people <laughs> that's not for in. me <laughs> well it, it was a fantastic series that took a long time to get the recognition it deserved I felt I was shocked yeah. about how long it, it took I mean it's great it's been it's hard because of course it's a different story every week so there's a lot of um burning up of ideas you know there's a lot of storytelling in inside number nine and each one of this some of them could have been whole series but we sort of get through a lot of storytelling but uh, it's great because we get to do lots of different things and tonally different comedically different things darker things more psychological things so it's a very enjoyable play box to be coming up with all this stuff but you know by the time we finish when we get to series nine we will have done 53 different films you know it's a lot of a lot of different worlds it is it is i came in i remember that i went to a commissioning conference a year or two before you started and one of the things that was definitely not in at that time was anthology shows is that what you yeah. described as? and I, you were completely going against the trend weren't you in television right? absolutely yeah no they've been very out of favor for a long time and of course there's a massive traditional a great history of brilliant ones and um i think it was just the perceived idea that commissioners had that people wouldn't be drawn into an episode to something that didn't have um continuity of character but you don't need it if it's good people don't really care what it is i don't think and especially now with there are increasingly more and more one-off stories on TV and I think they realise that people can and like to consume things beginning, middle and end and not have to commit to 25 weeks of one thing. Yeah, there was a um, commissioner who told me that ripping yarns was the reason why the one-off show no longer works. I think it was right. Michael Palin or someone like yeah, that. Terry Jones, yeah, they Terry Jones. That. Yeah, it was a post-Python project which never really took off apparently. Right, yeah. And they were very expensive, one one story each week tales, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah, we what... were out of favour, I think, but we've sort of wrangled it back into the, the mainstream. There's a new one coming on Netflix, I think, with uh, Guillermo del Toro's gathered together various directors to do one-off horror oh. stories. So um, it's not um, it's not as rare as it used to be. Last I heard, he was trying to do Lovecraft's Beyond the Mountains of Madness, the uh, the novella about the Antarctic exploration and the um, right. earlier, you know, ancient creatures. He's a bit of a Lovecraft man. Anyway, enough of horror. I'd better get yeah, back sorry. to the Station Hotel. Sorry, Dudley. Thank you very much, Reese. That's fantastic. Thank you All very right. much.
Right, go on then. Right, as I've actually got my presentation, I should probably actually show you the hotel. So <laughs> right, how do I get this to move on, Chris? You click the right hand button. Try the left hand button. There you go. There we go. Right, so I might have pinched this picture from an estate agent because um, last year, I think it was, um, Chris informed me that the station hotel was going to be sold. So I think we both kind of thought that's probably the end with the poor station hotel. Somebody yeah. will probably buy it, pull it down and build apartments. It's the kind of thing that's happening here. Yeah. Um, somebody did buy it and they have actually kept it at the hotel. When I was doing some research a couple of weeks ago, it is now the station hotel and banqueting. So they have fully refurbished all of the rooms. They now include kitchenette which I find a little bit unusual. So in each room, you have a kitchen counter. Um, oh, sorry, this cat's fighting outside, if you can hear that. Oh my God. Um, they have a fridge, a hob, a microwave, a complete little kitchen inside the room. Um, they also have now created a games room, a gym, and the most interesting part is they now have a Peaky Blinders themed bar. Have you ever watched Peaky Blinders? Half an episode, maybe. That's more than I have, and it's a shame because I normally quite like to watch things. But oh, I suppose it's set in Birmingham, isn't it? I think people yeah. blind us. So I suppose that's why they've gone down that route. Seems a little bit strange to me. So, so it is still there if you want to go and stay at the Station Hotel. It's a little bit more expensive than it was about a decade ago, but I still think it's quite reasonably priced. And it's probably lovely now it's been done up because the interior was very grand, just faded. Yeah, it just hadn't been modernised for on, a long time, I think. On the Peaky Blinders, I went through the uh, 1910 to about 1940 newspapers <laughs> for Dudley looking for ghost stories. And the only Peaky Blinder activity I found associated with this hotel was that for a short period in the 1930s, when a couple of chaps ran a, a stolen car ring from out the back. So there you go. That's about as criminal as it gets. OK. There you go. So this shot I just included just so people could have a look. Um, when I was researching the hotel, I decided to do a Google Earth search to have a look at it from the top because it's a very strangely shaped building. Um, so yes, there is an aerial view of the station hotel. So the um, first indication that the hotel might have been haunted um, they started ghost walks in 1993, I think it said in the article you sent yeah, me. Yeah, 1993. That the cellar was haunted. Um, in 94, there was an article in a local newspaper. A woman was waiting in the hotel for her queue on a ghost walk, and she saw um, a figure of a man in grey trousers and a black jacket walk towards the cellar. And the kitchen staff confirmed that they had also seen the same figure. I found a reference in our notes from the early 2000s in which it said that the lady in question was dressed as the murdered maid. So there was ah, a story of a murdered will, maid. Which will come um, out in a second. She was pretending to be a ghost when she saw the ghost, which is poetic justice, really. Yeah. So if you have heard of the station hotel before, that is probably because these people turned up in 2003. Uh, so they conducted an investigation at the hotel. Things that happened in the most haunted episode included a crew member was scratched across their face. They caught some video footage of a chair and a bed moving in room 214. Phil, oh, that was the one we were in, 214. And Phil Wyman on the right, Phil, who sometimes turns up, he's certainly on the Facebook group and is a good friend of mine. He was laying on the bed when it moved and actually was completely convinced it was genuine because he texted me immediately and asked me what the hell was going on mm. or said, I don't know what the hell's going on or something like that. If I remember rightly, I think it's, it's really quite visible on the video footage. Yeah, it, it shakes. It you can visibly move. Yeah. So I believe the person on the ghost walk was dressed up as an Elizabeth Hitchin. So this was something that when Derek went into the cellar and did his psychic thingy, um, he claimed that there was a chambermaid called Elizabeth Hitchin who was murdered in the cellar by the prior, prior how did you say that prior? proprietor. That's it. Um, of the hotel, George Williams. So they were apparently having an affair. 
she had threatened to tell his wife, so he murdered her in the cellar, dragged her up the barrel chute, and buried her, I believe, just outside the hotel. The not sure where. barrel chute would have gone forwards onto the road. Yeah, it goes back to the front. front. So he would have had to, in those days, drag her out, drag her across the road, down by the railway line, and bury her by the railway line. Yeah, railway probably, railway. because there's the railway line just opposite, isn't there? So probably there. Why didn't he just throw her into a coal wagon as it went past and should have next been found in Edinburgh? I don't know. Um, Murderers today, they just don't have any forethought. So Derek also claimed that there was a George Lawley who had visited the hotel and knew about the murder. I believe that was all he had to say about that. Um, the most haunted episode identified the most haunted areas of the hotel as the cellar, the restaurant, rooms 214 and 217. Remember anything else from the episode? About it, really, I think. That's roughly what happens in the episode. And of course, it set the ghost stories. In, in stone, so to speak, didn't it? I mean, it kind of established what they were. So when we stayed at the hotel, probably one of the first time, um, Chris spoke to the receptionist and yep. within minutes had asked about ghosts. And the receptionist produced this. Well, the spook book. This is a copy, not the original. Um, just after the episode aired, they decided to keep a book where staff and visitors could record any um, experiences they'd had in the book as a diary. So the book runs from, or at the time, it ran from 24th of April 2003 to the 5th of May 2006. So just over three years worth of entries. I think there were probably more, but when it came to my research, that was how many I took. So when it came to Doing my master's research a few years later, um, my supervisor asked what I would like to do. Um, he mentioned something along the lines of mirror gazing, scrying, something like that. I said, not a chance. I'm not a fan of staring in mirrors. I have a bit of a thing about mirrors. So I said I'd found a hotel that had this diary of entries of paranormal activity, which you don't get many locations. It's just something quite rare. So I said that I wanted to have a look at the entries in the book and see what was in there. See if there was anything that was good evidence of the hotel being haunted. So those cats are having a real fight out there, aren't they? You sure it's the cats and not the howling of the dam? Might be. Their thin, reedy voices calling from beyond the grave as they know. Actually, Hitchens, it turns out, much to my surprise, is actually a Dudley name. There is a Elizabeth Hitchens who was remarried after the death of her husband but I'm not finding a murder of that name. Yeah, there doesn't really seem to be any evidence for what, what Derek came up with. Or... But it is actually a real Birmingham, it is real Dudley family. So that does suggest there might be some truth in the story, albeit... Or just that Derek had done some research before we got there. You cynic. Well, maybe. So, uh, right. When I um, decided to do some research on the book book, I originally decided to do what was called a grounded theory. This is very boring, um, which wasn't the right thing to do on this particular piece of... Um, grounded theory is a bottom-up model as opposed to a top-down model, but basically any models are fine by me. But what I effectively did was go through, read each experience, and we'll go into that a bit more later, and have a look at what happened in them. Um, the hotel did give me permission to kind of have this. Um, they said I couldn't take the book away, but I could have a look at it in the hotel and do my research. I didn't really want to spend hours and hours and hours in the hotel looking through the book. So what I did was take pictures of each of the pages, take that home and type it up, all fully anonymised. So there's no, the only names in here are... Um, names picked up psychically, there's no group names, no names of staff or anything like that. Um, in fact, you discovered a few years ago that Spook Book's gone missing, didn't you? Come and stole it's been it, stolen it, yeah. Unfortunately, so I might contact... And they got a replacement and that was stolen as well. Wow, so I might contact the hotel and see if they'd be interested in this. So I went through each of the entries in the Spook Book and had a look at what had happened. Let's move on to the next slide. Oh, look, I nearly missed this slide. 
So in the book, I found seven categories of types of um, activity, shall we call it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, they're all on, are all on there. So we had sightings, movement, feelings, sensations, and injuries, sounds, technical problems, temperature, and smells. So we will make start with sightings. By far the most common type of activity reported in the spook book um, in terms of sightings was orbs. Um, and that was across all categories, not just sightings. Um, I don't really know what to say about orbs, to be honest. Um, the less the better. Well, yeah, orbs are quite... Um, Controversial. Con contentious, is that the word I'm thinking of? Bollocks? Oh, sorry. Some people who are slightly more maybe spiritually inclined... Um, take them seriously. Do take orbs seriously, and that, that's fair enough, if that's their, their belief. I think then. the... The problem with orbs is that most people, most of what's presented as orbs are in fact dust, whereas there could very well be some orbs which actually represent something genuinely supernatural. Yeah, I mean, we used to conduct an experiment at Derby Jail, didn't we, where we would get the people to dance around. Circle I would take dancing. A series of photos um, in progression, and when we looked at them, when they weren't dancing, there was maybe a couple of orbs because it was a very dusty place, but after they'd been dancing around for a couple of minutes, the photo was filled with orbs so most of them might be dust or bugs or whatever but there is the possibility that some might have a paranormal origin but I don't really think they are very good evidence myself um, so we'll move on from orbs um, there was also a lot of experiences which involved some kind of light um, either the light remained stationary um, or it travelled or the light flashed. Um, again, the hotel's a really weird shape and the car headlights do seem to shine. The roads, there are roads all around the station hotel, aren't there? Yeah. The headlights shine through the windows. In general, lights are a difficult one, aren't they? Again. It's, um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about lights. Could be paranormal, possibly. Might be reflection off of something. Car headlight. Car headlights. Brain lights, maybe. Yeah. Um, the next one was shadows. Um, most entries were saw a shadow. So, <laughs> again, lights and shadows kind of go hand in hand. Really, the problem with they? shadows is unless they're Hank Marvin coming through the window on a rope playing Apache, they are generally in this, you probably wouldn't get that chance. Am I too young? Yeah. Okay, okay never mind. But unless uh, most shadows are just, you know, your eyes adjusting to the darkness, and most mists, again, exercise outside have normal causes. Yeah. And in the station hotel, they might have in the old days been a miasma from the carpets. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, the next one was shapes and objects. Um, this was something described as a white shape, a black flash. A black ball, um, something along those lines. Yeah, and there were a lot of strange, not just corner of the eye, but strange sightings at different times in those three rooms. Um, I take those a little bit more seriously because people seem to be looking at something and the fact they couldn't describe what they were seeing. That was actually what came under miscellaneous. Saw something out of the corner of my eye was one of the... Um, Danny chat. What's he called? Heard. Danny Robbins, who did Uncanny. Ken in episode one of that he talks about a black triangle by the door of where oh um, not there it was a it was a hall of residence at Bel Queen's University Belfast but the interesting thing about that is it was similar to an experience I had once at Forward here and I think that's the kind of thing that people are describing when they suddenly become aware of what seems to be a a very specific shape but it doesn't appear to be a human mm. don't know yeah, quite quite difficult to um, comment on um, another thing that fell under miscellaneous was um, somebody saw a candle flickering in different directions. Um, that one is slightly lost on me, as I'm pretty sure that's what candles do, don't they? Yes, <laughs> they anyway. do flicker. The other thing that I remember quite clearly, though, which you haven't got down here, is the voices. Um, it's pretty further on. Oh, OK, then. Well, I'll shut up. Then. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, so 
there were also several apparitions reported in the hotel, which is more my kind of idea of something that's going to be good evidence for it possibly being haunted. Um, several of them, unfortunately, though, were seen when the person had woken up from being asleep. Um, which again is quite difficult. Um, when you wake up from sleep, you come out of the hypnopompic state. Yep. Um, and it is possible for things that you are dreaming about to persist into the waking state. I've had a couple of experiences like that myself, actually. When I lived back at home in Derby, I woke up one morning and I saw what looked like my bedroom door open pushed open slowly and a very short man on the other side stood looking at me um which I knew wasn't real because though I knew there wasn't a very short man in my house that was opening my door and then I kind of woke up I was gonna say snapped out of it I suppose woke up and saw the door as normal closed so yeah um in my research I did for my PhD if the person was certain that the figure that they saw after they'd woken from sleep was definitely in their surroundings rather than superimposed on their yeah surroundings. actually physically located yeah. the term the fbi used we did count it but i counted it as an apparition yeah why here though why one place i guess we're going to come back to that aren't we what? why so many people seeing ghosts in one hotel All right, let's go on. Um, right, I'm just going to check what's on the next slide because I think there is some more. Yes, 20 occurrences that featured some form of apparition. Um, so these included figures, faces and the appearance of a hand. What, just a hand? Yes, I believe so. If I a remember piece right. with five fingers. Which is similar to the kind of the experience that Rob, where Rob thought oh, yeah, the hand, hand was, was, the hand was coming, not got my head, was coming out of the wall. Um, to grab his head. Um, the faces that were reported were mostly seen in the cellar. Now, if you go to the hotel to investigate it, they will take you down in the cellar. Of course, it's one of the areas that you know is supposed to be most haunted. They will get you down there and they will flip the light off. Because that's what we do on investigations. We stand in the dark and hope to see something that we won't see because it's pitch black. Not on our staff investigations, we don't. So in the cellar in the dark. It's likely that in the darkness you will see places. It's what do we call it? Paradoilia. It was the Reverend in the cellar in the dark with the double handed um, candle. Sorry, Cluedo joke. Never mind, carry on. Weird. Weird. <laughs> um, right. So I think I have on the next slide. Yes, one of my one of the experiences. So there were a few good apparitional experiences that I found quite interesting. Um, some were apparently caught on camera, but I've got no way of seeing any of that footage or seeing any pictures, unfortunately. Um, one that I found quite interesting was this one. So during a seance in the dining room, I looked left from George's table and saw a man in the corner at the far end. He was only a short man wearing a white shirt with a collar and a camel coloured v-neck jumper. So 19... 50s, early 60s. I don't know. Well, camel colour is actually quite in from the 30s onwards, I think. But the V-neck and the collar sounds... The 30s, they had round neck collars, didn't they, quite often? I'm trying to remember, because V-necks mm -hmm. persisted in school uniform to when I was around in the 70s, but I think they came in in the 50s. This is where we need my oh, books on the history of fashion. Yeah. You do, but they're not as common. And camel colour... I think post-74, beige is forever a joke, because during the election of 74, beige and a kind of bright orange were the in colours, beige, <laughs> chocolate, ship brown, and a cow shut up. So just to clarify, George's table, I believe um, Derek Cora made a reference in the episode. Um, in the restaurant, there is one table that is raised up slightly on a, what do you call it? Dias, mezzanine, oh, no. Yeah. It's just a step higher. Than yeah, it's slightly higher than the others. And I believe Derek picked up George sitting at that table. I don't know if that was George, the proprietor, 
for proprietor. Proprietor. <laughs> or if that was the George that had visited the hotel, but this became known as George's Table, and several entries in the book talk about George's Table. So that's where that has come from. Let's move on. So feelings, sensations, and injuries. So um, bodily feelings and sensations, emotions, these are all um, pretty subjective things. Um, somebody reporting feeling that somebody has touched them or pulled them, um, that they suddenly got upset or felt ill. Um, they were being restrained, things along those kind of lines. Um, I never got pulled in Dudley, unless you count you. Which, which unfortunately, as I said, are quite subjective. So the person who experiences something like that, that might be quite good evidence to them if they believe something has grabbed hold of them and pulled them. But unfortunately, to anybody else who hasn't actually experienced it, it What about the scratches you had? I mean, you were pretty certain that they were not from... I mean, if I lie asleep here at night, I often get scratched. But the cat come and attack me, but you don't have a cat. 11 occurrences of people finding scratches okay. on their body. And are you um, psychic, dear? You know what's coming next? Um, so most commonly, these were found on either their arm or their face. As we have, did mention at the beginning, a member of the Most Haunted crew experienced a scratch on their face. Um, on one of the occasions that I visited, I also was scratched. I won't tell you where it was because it was quite private, um, but it was under several layers of clothing. It was deep, had drawn blood, um, but I've got no recollection of having scratched myself. I might have done, but as I said, it was it was quite deep. It was only your boot, wasn't it? Yes, dear. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, another common experience happened on seven occasions is somebody waking up and feeling like they were being held down or pinned to the bed. So this is an, another type of experience that is slightly, um, I can't remember that word again. Questionable? Yeah, we'll go with questionable. Um, so the person experiencing it, it probably feels very real and like somebody is pinning you down to the bed. Um, but there is the general consensus that this is normally sleep paralysis. The problem is that although sleep paralysis is invoked all the time, there is no physiological mechanism that is universally agreed for sleep paralysis. There is no mm. medical testing that can show it was sleep paralysis. And sleep paralysis is essentially a placeholder in which we say something is happening, which is obviously medical, not demons, but we don't actually really know how it works. So there's several things that we, we can't explain why it actually... It sounds scientific and medical and reassuring, but actually sleep paralysis doesn't have. Um, Cardina et al, which varieties of anomalous phenomena, which is on your right, for experience, they go into some detail. And the more I looked at it, the more I realised nobody really knows what sleep paralysis is. No, I mean, I had my first experience of sleep paralysis, oh, it must have been about four years ago now. Um, you know, the pandemic's knocked two years out of the mind, but four years ago, um, we were in a hotel where we were doing ghost walks and things, weren't we? For Newmarket, for Halloween Market. 2018. Um, we luckily had two different beds in our room, one like almost kind of in a corner sectioned off, which I had taken to to avoid your snoring. And I woke, I, shut up. I woke up in the night and had a sleep paralysis experience, never had one before. And I knew full well as soon as I woke up that that was what was happening. It was sleep paralysis, but it was still terrifying. Um, it felt like somebody was pinning me down. It felt like the bed was going down either side of me. I tried to call for Chris, but nothing came out. In fact, he said afterwards he heard kind of like gurgling noises from me before I managed to call his name. And I also, there wasn't a chair next to the bed, but I also saw a chair next to the bed that fell over in slow motion. I don't know what relevance that had to, if something was pinning me into the bed. Um, like I said, I knew what was happening and what it was, but it was still terrifying. So, And in fact, you didn't manage to wake me. The reason that I came around the corner 
at that point was because I'd come around to see it was the middle of the night and I got up and I couldn't find something. I can't remember if it was a charger or something. So I come around to see where you were and why you got out of bed and was going to ask you for a charger. No, so you didn't come to rescue me. Well, I mean, obviously I came dashing to rescue you. Yes, but only after I heard you making a funny noise. Right, so this is an example of one of the experiences. Um, suddenly woke for no apparent reason. Felt the sensation of being tied to the bed and I could not move. Tried to shout and all that came out was gurgles. Has a burning sensation in the throat. That's a good night out in Cricklewood, that is. These are typed off exactly as they were written in the book. The um, grammar, etc., is not always very good. So the next category was temperature. Um, this was generally involved experiences involving the temperature of the room rather than body temperature, although there were, were experiences where the person commented on body temperature. Um, several entries describing the rooms as either very hot or very cold. Now, we've already talked about the state of the hotel, very old building. Um, the windows didn't fit very well. Um, no, the sash windows used to rattle in the slightest breeze, didn't they? Yeah, so it, it was quite a drafty place. And depending on the room you were in, I think, some of them could be very cold, depending on the time of year in the room you were in, just from letting in the cold from outside. Um, the most notable time when we were there, we were there in December. Um, I'm going to drop that. I wonder if it's still drinkable. It was close to freezing outside. Um, we left the window open all night. And it was still absolutely roasting hot in our room. So after a little bit of investigation, we found a huge pipe. I don't think I've ever seen a pipe so big before. Mm, it's one of the main sort of heating boiler pipes. It was something to do with the hot water or the heating or something like that. And it was absolutely, it was hot, boiling hot to touch, wasn't it? That ran under the head of our bed. So I assume it was that that was making the room so hot. Right. So movement. Um, so this generally included furniture. Um, most common experiences involve the movement of furniture such as chairs, wardrobes and beds. Um, there was also beds vibrating or shaking. And there were cases where drawers, doors and windows opened or closed on their own. Glasses moving was quite common as well. Yeah, I was thinking. I do um, windows closing on their own. They were old windows. Sash, most of the sash type windows, I think, weren't they? Yeah, they were. So, I mean, your window is in danger of falling down at any point. Um, I'm just switch the book over. Um, obviously, this was what was caught on, caught on the most haunted episode with the bed and the chair moving, which was caught on camera. So the most haunted episode we believe was filmed around October 2002. A few weeks before it was recorded, um, the UK experienced one of the largest earthquakes that we'd had for a decade, which measured five on the Richter scale. And I remember it myself, I was working in my student job in McDonald's. I was sat in the canteen on my break and a metal chair and I suddenly felt this vibration up my chair. And I thought, that's really weird. What's that? Later discovered it was an earthquake. Um, I just thought the cat knocked something over and then I noticed that the wardrobe had moved in my bedroom here in Cheltenham. Yeah. And actually terrible. it would have been about then because it was just, Phil had come down from Freshers Week at my university, Phil Wyman, who was the person it happened to. Mm. And that was a couple of weeks, that would have been the first week of October, last week of September. That was just before it happened. So, yeah. So it was later found that the epicentre, oh, hello, I'm joined by a cat. Um, Hi, Lloyd. The epicentre of the um, earthquake was four miles from the station hotel in Marmalade. Becky doesn't destroy Dornall. So the hotel is close to the Malvern Lineament. Is that how you say it? I think so, yeah. Malvern Which Lineament. Line. Yeah. And Dudley also lies over several disused disused mines that have caused subsidence in some areas. There is a pub somewhere close to the station hotel. The Crooked House. The Crooked House. Apparently named, I believe, because it has subsided on one side and is now crooked. Yeah. So 
I'm certainly no expert on this, but there it appears a possibility that there is ground movement under the hotel. That doesn't even sound quite unstable to me. Um, mm -hmm. What level of movement that can actually manage to produce, I don't know. Like I said, I'm no expert, but when it comes to furniture vibrating or shaking or small, small movement, could that so, kind of underground activity cause that kind of movement? G.W. Lambert postulated that in 1953 when he's president of the SPR and he wrote mm. a paper on it. And I spent much of the 90s messing around with the geo, mm. with basically geological ideas for hauntings, but one of the things I discovered back then was Tony Cornell in the 70s had bought a or been given a house by Cambridge Council that was condemned. So he got an ex council house that was condemned. So this is this the house that he basically tried to shake yeah. down. Yeah. And him and Alan Gould and Howard Wilkinson, they put they got some heavy earth moving gear and they vibrated the house to destruction, which was valuable to, I guess, chartered engineers, surveyors, and people who need to know about how housing copes with earthquakes but it was mainly they did it because they put objects around the building and as they vibrated the building they waited to see when they would come off the windowsills and mantelpiece yeah i think didn't they find that the sort of movement that you find in some poltergeist cases where things are essentially flying across the room you had to effectively shake the house down to get to get that to actually get a packet of cigarettes to jump off the mantelpiece tony told me and i mean he did sometimes slightly you know not exaggerate but he used extreme examples but to get it to fly off he said you could have an, a hole that you could put your arm through and the walls would have to appear first now you can have a hole like that big in houses because pete highly did if you remember his gas boiler well yeah i'm not sure he actually wanted a hole that no big. no that's why, we, why when i lived there we couldn't actually get a, the uh the gas boiler because the gas would come straight back in again through the hole but yeah, you you know, it's that kind of, you you see daylight. Mm. So if you can see daylight through the cracks in your walls, then it might be vibration, but usually it isn't. Okay, okay. Ken. Move on to the next one, which was smells. So for this one, prior to the smoking ban that came in in July 2007, I think it was, smoking was allowed in the hotel and in all of the rooms on the second floor so when we first started going to the hotel you could still smoke in the rooms you never let me no it's not nice you um, stand with the top off. so basically in places the hotel stank of smoke didn't it and for years afterwards because that's what smoke does isn't it it gets into the curtains and the carpet and so any experiences where somebody walked into a room, I suppose it depends what room it was, but if it was on the second floor and somebody walked into a room and smelt smoke, then yeah. Um, other smells that were reported included eggs, lovely, um, flowers, a musty smell, or just described as a funny or strange smell. The problem is with smells is they're very hard to char characterise, and even today, professional perfumiers don't really have technology that can do it. It relies on a, a very, very, very sophisticated conch. Yeah, there's also some people who smell something and nobody else can, and yeah, it's just not. He can't smell anything, can he? He's always telling me. No, he can't smell anything. He's burnt it away with paint. Mm. So nothing particularly impressive in the old category, really. Um, then we have sound. Um, so generally, this was noises such as taps, bangs, knocking, creaking, and clicking. Which, unfortunately, in an old building, there's probably going to be a lot of water dripping through pipes, floors creaking. Um, Not the best one. Get to the best one. So what are you talking about? The common experience of hearing a kettle click. Was that the best one? Kettles clicking was pretty good, but that wasn't my favourite. My favourite no, was the plastic bag. About the bag rustling, aren't you? Yep. Ghost hunters are very fond of response. Four, four separate ghost hunters recorded carrier bag rustled in response to questions. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically, if you screw up a carrier bag, it can be unravelling for hours, I think. So, um, yeah. Um, another one was footsteps, which can be quite interesting. Um, but in none of the entries did anybody actually mention going to see if anybody could have created the footsteps. I think I've got one. Yes, we were sitting in the lounge bar at 11.45 p.m. when we heard footsteps going up to the restaurant. Five minutes later, the footsteps came back. 
Um, but there was nothing with the entry to say. We went and had a look and found that nobody could have created the footsteps. So, so they heard footsteps, but they didn't actually check if it was a real person. Really not. In a hotel, a public they, hotel, they didn't. where people walk up and down corridors. Well, it, it was 11.45pm, so I suppose it was quite late. But, it's not um, late. Well, no, to most normal people it's late, not, not to us night owls. Right. So there was quite a lot of technical problems. Um, this generally involved problems with phones, cameras, lights and televisions. Involved them turning on and off. Um, and pictures or footage being deleted and batteries being drained. Um, the most common experience is a camera or cam recorder turning itself off. Um, only one entry confirms the camera was recording at the time, so it shouldn't have been automatic shut off. Um, the thing with televisions and cameras is normally if you're if you leave your television on for a certain amount of time, I believe some of them have automatic shut offs. Um, turning themselves on is a little more, little more interesting, but um, technical equipment does unfortunately go wrong quite regularly, especially if you're trying to conduct an investigation or something like that. Um, what are you up to? He's dismantling the book coat. Um, so I think that was the last. Um, oh, there was one other, other which contained experiences that didn't fit into any of the other categories. So this was generally information that was um, provided by a medium, and often it wasn't clear whether it was something they actually did see or whether it was something that they picked up psychically. Um, things that people had claimed happened at the hotel in the past. The cat was eating it. Okay. Um, yeah, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, yes, thank you, dear. Right, let me go back slightly. Can you let Paul with it? So, hello, Paul. Um, right, yes, completely lost my train of thought now. So, basically, there were all these little experiences which add up to a narrative of a haunting. But to be completely honest, I think calling them experiences in the spook book is a little bit strong if those had happened to you uh, in a railway no, station would you have thought they were going to um generally the most of the entries in the book i believe were from ghost hunters shall we say um people who'd seen the most haunted episode they're part of a group maybe or they go around with their friends and conduct you know um investigations and the level of these entries shall we call them in there wasn't very good um most of them were along the lines of entered room and it was really hot, saw an orb, um, the kettle clicked, um, somebody felt sick, along those kind of lines, just a list of supposed activity. There was nothing like the sort of experiences that I collected in my research where there was effectively a story um, where somebody described seeing something in detail, providing lots of nice details for me. In general, they were just a list of proposed activity. And going through and looking at them like we have just done, unfortunately for me, they are not very strong evidentially. Well, say. let's give you a classic case. This is from Dudley across the road. Is that all right? Yes. The Mystery of the Mis Missing Fish, Harry Troman, 1964. The report of a ghost at the gallery at Stratford on Avon and the plans to detect it reminds me of the night some years ago I spent ghost hunting at Dudley Zoo. It all started when fish started to disappear from the large display tanks in the aquarium. I must say I cannot imagine a better setting for a ghost hunt than in the aquarium, for it's actually housed in part of the castle ruins used once as a crypt. Before the ghost hunt took place, the then general manager, Mr Donald Risden, a down-to-earth man who now runs a bird sanctuary near Bath, first insisted on practical steps to try and solve the mystery of the missing fish. He believed that a rather elusive cat had somehow managed to find a secret entrance to the aquarium. Marmalade. The uh, door was sealed and black cotton crisscrossed the whole of the aquarium about a foot off the floor. A broken thread would have undoubtedly indicated a physical presence, but although the cotton trap was repeated, it was never found broken and more fish vanished. 
The aquarium attendants at that time reported strange noises and reported that he'd experienced sudden blasts of cold air he could not explain. Soon afterwards, a team of psychical research investigators were on their way to the, sea, to the zoo to keep an all-night vigil in the aquarium. They set up an impressive array of equipment, including an infrared camera, highly sensitive sound detectors, and the latest type of recording gear. And we all settled down for the night. Research investigators, reporters, including a man from the BBC with his own recording equipment. But nothing happened. The vigil was a success in one direction, but a fish no longer disappeared from the aquarium. The mystery of the missing fish, however, still remains unsolved. <laughs> it's quite a daft story, but it gives you an idea of how usually there's a bit more to it. Uh, that's from just across the road, because the zoo's at the castle, which overlooked the hotel. And the other one I found that's very close by was Ghost of a Blonde Woman, Psychic Society May Visit Dudley. Members of the Birmingham Psychic Research Society, 1954, are trying to arrange to stay at the night in the former Jolly Collier Inn, Holly Hall, Dudley, where it said the ghost of a blonde woman has been seen. The inn ceased to be licensed three years ago, and since that time, it's been used as a house by a family named Westwood. A week ago, several members of the family said they'd seen this ghost, and a son, Edward, said that he was tipped out of bed by an unseen hand. The Westwoods refused to return to the house and are staying with relatives. So again, those are classic ghost stories. But the interesting thing was, no matter how far I went through the records, and I found all these strange stories from Dudley and Birmingham, and a fantastic one from Chesterfield that I'll have to wait. But all of these stories are, are different in tone, and they are, you know, you find references to them in various newspapers. There seems to be nothing before 1993 associated with the station and ghosts. Yeah, that, there seems to be very little kind of evidence to support what the hotel have claimed themselves and what happened what the previous management of the hotel well yes because they're a different management now but previous management what they have claimed what the most haunted episode supposedly bought up um and there are several things in the book about um people picking up psychically that people had fallen over banisters and things like that but there appears to be absolutely nothing to support any of these i did find the death of one owner who died peacefully in hospital at great age, the wife of an owner. But I couldn't find any tragedies associated with the hotel, unfortunately. Yeah, so basically we've got three years worth of what I keep calling experiences, um, diary entries. Or ghost hunters call research or evidence. Yeah, but looking at them closely, like I have done, but I think there's very, very little in there to actually kind of justify saying that the hotel is haunted. And I did actually find earlier, because I looked at, um, I'm not sure it was actually their website, I think it might have been a booking site, but the new owners do have a bit in their spiel about, um, we are known as one of the most haunted hotels in the country, so they are aware of the, mm. the haunted history. But there were 30 or different ghost groups, maybe more, maybe as many as 50, I can't recall, but 30 or so which had different names who came, weren't there? Yet we don't see a oh. narrative emerge. You might expect to have found, you know, that they all picked up a Mildred or they all experienced that the window, suddenly blood ran down the window or the door lock jammed and they were trapped within or the, you know, they heard a terrible <laughs> noise in their ear while they were sitting there by the window. But that doesn't happen. There's no consistency in the apparitions. And that was what we found at Derby Jail, wasn't it? Every group brought its own ghosts. Yeah, so in my opinion, and this is just my opinion of the people may, may think other things, but I do actually wonder whether at some point one of the owners of the hotel thought, I know, that sounds like a good idea. Shall we have a ghost? I don't know. I mean, the most haunted episode, well, they were in series two, I think, weren't they? They, they were in series two, two because Phil was in it. The peak of the whole most you know paranormal tv programs kind of yeah the was peak in, was series four or five was it yeah okay well building up to the peak then but yeah so i was kind of disappointed when i did work my way through the book that um yeah there wasn't anything great in there basically so yes so I what you're saying is that what ghost hunters regard as evidence of ghosts is different to what people who report ghosts to you as having had ghost experiences who actually phone up and say we've seen a ghost or fill in a questionnaire and say i've seen a ghost yeah i mean jen if this was another hotel that wasn't known as 
been supposedly haunted I think half of the activity that was recorded in the book just people wouldn't even have considered that it might be paranormal you know if the kettle clicked a plastic bag rustled the pipes bumped the, yeah I mean they just wouldn't yeah it wouldn't even cross their mind that it was haunted so yes unfortunately I think my conclusion appears to be that there is very little evidence that the hotel is haunted um yeah basically but it's a good place for me to run off with my mistresses well thank you very okay. much um i didn't interrupt much did i no not much dear good. but um good good excellent because she was worried that i might interrupt so uh i did feel a moment there that a bit like the paranormal equivalent of richard and jo judy when you start to tell me <laughs> off thank you very much so let's move over to the questions unless somebody else has come in who wants to host that tonight so we have the, the key takeaway from all of this is that Becky did some research into apparitional experiences and that what ghost hunters report in their actual own notes and submit as reports are completely different to what you actually find in apparitional experiences um, as reported as spontaneous cases. So maybe that tells us something i don't know so now let's go over to the questions i think i'm the only one here who can actually go through the questions Are you okay all right i'm my bed if you want to um right chat righty ho right i will go up to the top and find out sorry it's taking me a moment so good evening good evening good evening good evening everybody hello 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 i think we might have 63 oh okay karen went there in, as a child in the 60s uh, yeah went to the zoo once a domestic sounds awesome i'm glad i stayed at the premiere in instead <laughs> yes yeah, premiere in common fleas generally so it was pretty awful isn't it is this going to be recorded yes uh, I didn't get bitten, but that must have been luck. Definitely we lucky. ran that game there, didn't we? I wrote a murder mystery set around real events in the history of the hotel where people played characters from the 1920s holding a seance to conduct the spirit of a missing... Um, yes. somewhere. Of a Burris. missing ex We filled the hotel explorer. with feathers from Feather Boas, didn't we? That's right, because all the ladies wore Feather Boas. That was good fun. Uh, Bourneville College. Actually, I would say the station's a fantastic place to stay, and it's just. By any chance, the Dudley Bug. Yeah, we used to run an RPG con at Aston. No, no, the Dudley Bug Ball was always at Dudley. I left Brum in 1994, Aston for a conference. Oh, they're talking about where to hold the. Um, Lenny Henry's Mickey Taker Thriller, which had all the zombies as Aston Villa fans. Right, okay. Lots of discussions here of inside number nine, ripping yarns, escape from style of Luft, yeah, okay. Monty Python, Radio 4 did a feature about Peaky Blinders. It was a kind of Edwardian music cult, like Mods, Rockers and Teddy Boys. Yeah. I know a lot of people are into Peaky Blinders, so. What was your Sorry, master's course called? It was Psychology of Exceptional Human Experiences. Coventry, run by who was it? It was after Vic Tanya died, so it was Tony That's Lawrence. Lovely, and yeah. yeah. We are no longer on speaking terms. <laughs> Nobody gets some of their PhD supervisor after they finish. The Radio 4 program. Oh. Hmm. I don't see a single question. Oh, the ram in. The owner would bang the doors with his sticks before he charged the crowd. Oh my God. The amount of orbs that there must have been at the ram in, that place was disgusting. The <laughs> cat piss. Oh dear. Yeah, it was those days were the days. Inside the first floor, I think, collapsed. Yeah. Poor old John. Reese, um, the if you've never seen, if you've never heard the radio show, um, which features the League of Gentlemen going haunted. I actually didn't say anything because I was spent most of the evening outside in case it collapsed on top of my head. But um, yeah, good times. There's the Crooked <laughs> House. It is an amazing pub, Fresh Kelly Dixon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, unfortunately, there wasn't enough detail to differentiate. Yeah, they don't give notes, but I mean, you, you definitely can. I mean, you can tell the difference between, say, Cherry, Ready Rub and, um, you know, Old 
what was it called? Rough Shag. I always used to laugh at that, the black rough shag. I see his new subsidence, but then the new drug around the public way. <laughs> the crooked have there's some great links from that. Oh, okay. You didn't have a single question. Six questions at the bottom. Oh, okay. What are the existing interpretations of paranormal scratches? My interpretation was that ladies don't notice when the wiring goes in their bras. I offer to a to investigate because after all bust feeling makes me ghost good sorry ghost busting makes me feel good but at the end of the day um i'm perfectly aware of how my bra works and it was not the underlying okay all right fair enough i just thought it was worth investigating there are any um interpretations of paranormal structure there is a condition that a couple of my girlfriends had by which you could write on them my cousin's got that i can't remember what it's called yeah. they basically had paper in skin because I used to be able to write my initials on one of my girlfriends. To an extent, I'm slightly like that. Are you? So, Maybe I just go out with diseased women. Uh, sorry, pale women. So they always seem to be pale, but you know. Uh, sounds like paranormal investigation groups need a psychic on the team to provide an encompassing narrative. Yeah, probably. So thank you very much indeed. Um, no, let's just go back to Reese if we can. Reese, you still there? The boarding staff. He might have gone to make his dinner. I right am. Now. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. So, what did you make of the ancient ram in, apart from jokes about the ghost of Rod Hull? <laughs> well, I was very susceptible to all the stories. It was it, John was very compelling in his. Um, you know, we went round it for this Radio Four program, and it was when I first met you, wasn't it? Yeah, I, me and Becky actually stayed outside. There was a a, a witchy lady and yeah, a medium who were there. Yeah. yeah. She yeah. did a meet. She did a séance for us in the middle of the night, yeah. and um, that was when we, the Mark Gatiss then picked her up on the fact that she was talk, talking about this um, ghost of this soldier that had come through, and he said, "Why isn't she speaking? Why isn't he speaking in Normandy French?" <laughs> and she didn't really have an answer to that. But um, anyway, yeah, the ram in itself was. It was very dirty. I mean, that it will have been dust as far as orbs are concerned. I mean, there were mummified rats oh, just on the floor. Years. It's probably changed a lot since John died. Um, yeah. I feel very sorry for him. I, I first went there in 92. Yeah. We carried out an investigation and we wrote it up. It should be lodged with the SPR. So this is one thing groups are very bad at, is actually lodging their reports. If you've done an investigation somewhere, please do send us your report. Even if you didn't do it through ASAP, we'd love to have a copy. We're not going to critique it. We might not even get around to reading it. But it just means that someone in the future will have a copy of it for when somebody else is researching and you will be credited. Yeah. Otherwise, all well, this people do I, just disappears. I remember the fire alarm going off in the middle of the night or some sort of alarm that had been set up went off and that really frightened Jeremy Dyson. And we were all slightly, I mean, the only one that was completely inert of, of all of it was Mark, who was completely um, unflappable. But I did start to sort of feel a little bit unnerved by being in the room that apparently a witch was in the, appears in the middle of the night in the chimney, in the, in the fireplace. John told me to look out for it. And they were the, but the creepiest part, despite that, was that on the bed there was all these stuffed gorillas. That's the bishop. It was like about three different stuffed toy gorillas, and it was just really a bit weird. There were too many of them. But I don't, I don't know whether they were his or what they were. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a fun night, and it was nice to meet you. And you were but, and you were quite surprised by it. when we had the um, recordings back. There was some strange tappings, weren't there? But it turned out to be Mark Gatiss doing it. Yeah, yeah. Which was a shame because yeah. we thought we'd solve the mystery of life after death. <laughs> well, at that point, it was must have been around about 2010, because in 2008, um, Barry Colvin had come up with the hypothesis that poltergeist cause wrappings have a different acoustic profile. So if you look at the actual, you know, acoustic waveform, then he said they have a sustained attack, that the, the attack is delayed. So they take longer to rise to peak amplitude than an ordinary knock on wood, you know, as in Amy Stewart. And um, in fact, I later discovered that exactly the same hypothesis was put forward in Conjuring Up Philip by Owen in, I think, 1974 or five. 
you know, the famous book about the Philip experiment, and he'd also noticed that supposedly paranormal caused waveforms had a different shape. Yeah, but I was yeah. very skeptical about it because I thought that it was probably just because the microphone's picking up through the table. If the microphone's weight is sitting on the table, it's picking up through the wood, which will arrive faster, and through the air, which will be slightly slower, depending on the distance from the noise source. And that would cause a overlapping sustained amplitude, you know, a sustained attack on the wave. So I wasn't entirely convinced, but when Mark started tapping, I did at least say, oh, OK, we can test that and see if it's paranormal. Yeah, there was some slight intrigue about it. That's right. I was quite surprised, actually. I don't think Mark was expecting me to argue with him because he seemed quite remarkably sceptical in that kind of mode of, um, oh, magician chap. He forgot his name. Friend of Wiseman, friend of Richard, lovely chap. Um, um, uh, Andy Nyman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much along that kind of line of materialist thinking. And I was thinking, well, many of these arguments can be refuted quite easily. So yeah. I got into quite an argument. And in fact, I actually end up, you actually included quite a large part of me wittering in the show, which shocked me because it was incredibly dull. But there you go. <laughs> it was, it was fascinating. I suppose. Especially after the wake of having had the Lady at Midnight with the, uh, the seance. Because that was slight, I didn't really know what to make of that, to be honest. But yeah, I, I think my takeaway was that I was very susceptible to wanting to be feel frightened. And I did get quite unnerved. I think most people do in that place, to be honest. The problem yeah. is, if we look back at all the experiences we've had over the years, and so if you look back at these weird experiences you've had, you've had other weird experiences over the years, haven't you? you I don't know if you want to share any of them, but you saw a... Um, you saw a glass move once, I believe. Is that right? Oh yeah, I did actually. Yes, in uh, in a hotel, in a very new hotel in Cheltenham. This glass yeah. moved the table. Yes, I remember. It was very. That was very strange because that I could not. That was like watching something in a, a Harry Potter. It just slid across the table. A dry, a dry marble table because it looks like aquaplaning, like it was on water, but it certainly wasn't. And I tried to do it, replicate it immediately. And it was it was it was actually hard to push it across the table, but it looked smooth to the eye. It was very odd. And uh, the waiter came along and just took the glass away, swept the glass away. At that point. <laughs> He's been that, that, that's been involved in some incidents, but they they took it away. Yeah, can't explain that. And that there went that. the one haunted piece of evidence that could have changed the face of modern physics. Yeah, it was just taken back to the kitchen and put in a dishwasher. But the problem with these, all of these instances, none of them seem particularly meaningful. I mean, you know, if I was a discarnate spirit trying to communicate, I would expect, I would try and make some kind of pattern. I would try and communicate some information. I would try and give something evidential. None of them, yeah. whereas these, these are all somewhat random. I, I mean, it was entertaining to lock you in the room. Do you think it could just be your own unconscious sabotaging you? <laughs> not, not with that. I mean, I think that was just unfortunate that we... It felt like an immediate um, omen, as far as our the rest of the night was going to be concerned. That I would just go in the room and the door would break immediately. But it wasn't like I mean, it was like we've described. It was actually properly locked. Like we had to, you know, I have forgotten that they had to use the, um, to get me out with the. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the yellow the one went first, and then when you were pulling on the doorknob, the pin came out and fell down the inside of the door, which is why yeah, you then yeah. threw the keys down to me outside. And the damned were playing that night in the little nightclub just across the road down at the bottom of the hill. So there were loads of goths walking past. It was quite a dark evening. I remember the street lamps and you hurling the keys and me being convinced you were trying to brain me. <laughs> I went in and we got the guy. He came up and he was so laid back. He sort of, oh, well, these things happen. Have you ever known someone to get locked in a room before? Well, no, no. How long have you been here? Well, 20 years. But no, no, it's never happened before. But, you know, it's just it's one of those things. We won't hold it to blame. Yeah. Do you know who the gentleman is? Never heard of him, no. no. So I said, okay, well, let's, let's get him out. And then he went down and got a screwdriver. And by that time, I think he'd retreated into the bathroom because the light had blown or something. I can't remember what happened next. Didn't, yeah, the overhead light bulb blew while you were trying to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Broke, and then the light bulb blew. Which is why we ended up sitting in there by the light coming from the hallway with you in the corner. And you heard the noise, and at that point, I couldn't get anybody to come back in. Yeah, because they let us use the room for the night, didn't they? They had no door on, they didn't really have much choice. But, um, yeah, yes, it was all very that, strange. Yeah. Maybe some people are just more susceptible than others to causing, you see, if we, 
causing damage. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, and more accident prone, like me. But but thank you very much for talking tonight with us. Oh, yeah. Thank you to Becky, and hopefully we will go ghost hunting again soon. It's been quite. Well. Oh, Teaspoon wants to know. That's Jody. Which hotel in Cheltenham was it that you had the experience? Oh, it, I can't remember now. It was the. Is it the Kandinsky? No, I can't remember what it was. I'll try. I'll try and find out, and I'll message you because I'll okay. be able to find out from the year it happened. The Kandinsky is the one at the top of the hill when you stayed last time you came down when we went to Woodchester. Right. No, That's it wasn't. That's the top of the Ladies College. The other one, the other ones are the things like uh, the St George's, which is around the. Oh, corner. is it the, the, the Chapel Hotel or is it Ch the? Oh no! What was it called? I'll try and remember. Yeah, don't worry. Chapel Spa, perhaps. Anyway, thanks very much. Yeah, I've written a paper recently on Cheltenham Ghost, which I don't know if you've seen. It was in the last journal article, which is a quite bizarre story. But I'll do I'll do another in, uh, do another uh, article on that sometime. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry it's been a bit of a strange night. Mm -hmm.